So welcome to the Friday Transportation Seminar at Portland State University. My name is uh, Christopher Monsieur, and together with my colleagues, Jennifer Dill, Miguel Filioti, uh, John Glebe, Ashley Hare, and anybody else I'm forgetting, we co-organized this Friday Transportation Seminar. We're very pleased today to have one of our own uh, graduates and uh, soon-to-be uh, research associates at the Center for Transportation Studies, Nathan McNeil, to um, talk about his uh, his paper that he did about bikeability and neighborhoods. So with that, I'll turn it over to Nathan. some other uh, evaluations and assessments of, of bikeability in related uh, areas, then move on to kind of figuring out how do you carry out an assessment of how bikeable a neighborhood is. That'll start with uh, identifying and mapping destinations, the places that you actually want to get to, uh, identifying a bikeable area. So how do you figure out kind of what a bike shed is, where can you get to from any given point, uh, from any given starting point, such as a home. Um, and then how do you create a score or, an or kind of an objective assessment of that, uh, the bikeability of that area? And then I'll move on to kind of findings and next steps and where do we go from there. So first, the background and context. Uh, so there's obviously a lot of interest in bicycles for utilitarian transport. Uh, the, the Portland 2030 bike plan uh, aims to have a 25% mode share for bicycles by the year 2030. Um, that's a big step to take from here, and how do we get there? How do we make neighborhoods so that they're more friendly to bicycles, so that you can get more things done, so that it's a more attractive option? Um, and then there's been a focus on 20-minute neighborhoods, both in Portland and elsewhere. Uh, the basic idea behind a 20-minute neighborhood is kind of getting your needs met within a, a reasonable and accessible area. It's usually thought of as walkable, but here I'm kind of taking it and saying, what if we apply the idea of bikeability to a 20-minute neighborhood? Um, how do we get our needs met within that area? And then the third uh, you know, piece of the context is pushing the conversation about bikeable communities. How do we you know, continue this conversation, keep it going forward, and kind of learn and, and progress that way? Um, I needed a setting for how, where I was going to look at, where I was going to set this research and kind of what were the areas that I was going to evaluate. Um, I took a look at some bike mode shares in in Portland, um, as you can see, areas east of uh, I-205, so east of right there, um, the bike mode shares are generally between 0 and 1%. This is for uh, you know, biking to work uh, mode share. Uh, that's really low, obviously. It's a lot lower than the areas of downtown. Part of that is proximity, but I also think that there are some other factors that 
uh, that play into why people are not uh, biking in those areas quite as much. Um, so kind of the goal was to kind of say, okay, we have these different areas. How can we assess them, and f what can we learn uh, about about uh, you know, what the differences are and what's important about those differences? Um, so just to kind of get to what some of the key questions that we'll be talking about are. So what what types of places do people actually visit? How often do they do it? Uh, where are those places actually located? It's kind of you know getting all of the potential destinations, figuring out what they are, and putting them on a map so that we can kind of work with them uh, and build, build them into an assessment. Um, how far will a person cycle? How do you determine what a bikeable area is? So if we have you know, someone starting at their home location, where can they get to within their, kind of within their willingness and within their ability to bike? Um, so that'll look like kind of a, a, an expanding graph out from, from that home location and you know, following the road network. Uh, how many essential destinations fall within this bikeable area? So once we know where you can get to, how many of the places that we looked at in the first part fit within that area? Um, so how many of the gro how many grocery stores can you get to? How many uh, restaurants can you get to? So, and so on. And then finally, how can we use this information in these fr that we've gathered from these first few questions and use that to evaluate bikeability? Um, before I go any further forward, uh, forward I just want to say that if you guys have clarifying questions, uh, definitely uh, hit me with them as you get them. Um, we'll save maybe more substantive questions uh, for the end of the uh, for the end of the talk. So again, clarifying questions, definitely shout them out. Um, a quick look at yeah, go ahead. Thanks. A clarifying question for the mode share map that you showed is that uh, where residents. And commuting wherever yeah. they may go, or was that based no? On the so workplace? that map is based on their home location, um, and it's a commute to work uh, numbers. So, yeah. So in terms of prior work and studies, what I'll just say about this before I move into a few specific studies is that generally things in the past that have looked at walkability, uh, studies that have looked at walkability, have been focused on the kinds of destinations that you can get to. You know, how easy is it to get to your corner market? How easy is it to get to the cleaners, how easy is it to get to a restaurant? Can you walk to those places? Um, those tend to be studies about proximity. Um, they don't tend to have uh, very much infrastructure built into the studies in terms of you know, how, how good is the route that's going to get you there. And uh, again, generally don't have uh, issues of uh, bike infrastructure built in. And then past studies about bikeability uh, have generally focused on uh, infrastructure alone and haven't looked very deeply into uh, land use and destinations. So some of you may be familiar with walkscore.com. This is a pretty interesting uh, walkability assessment. You can basically go in, type uh, any address, and uh, it'll give you a score for you know, what they determine the walkability of that area to be. I, for this one, I put in the Portland State Bookstore. Uh, it's a walker's paradise, apparently, 98 points. Um, what this, what the walk score program does is it kind of looks at the vicinity um, around that location and finds the nearest, uh, well, the nearest restaurant, the nearest coffee shop, the nearest grocery store, the nearest shopping generally, um, and gives a score based on how close those things are. Um, I think it only looks at, like it'll look, it'll find the closest restaurant, but it won't look beyond that to find out if there's more than one. Um, until very recently, I think it followed a, it basically went as the crow flies. It didn't follow the street network at all. So uh, if there were barriers in the road, it, it wouldn't have uh, found those uh, or recognized them. Um, another thing that's been done a little bit closer to home is the Portland Bikeway Quality Index. Uh, this was essentially, uh, they took all of the, this was done for the city of Portland. They took all of the routes in Portland and uh, basically, um, rated them according to a number of characteristics. They, they rated them based on uh, ve motor vehicle speed, number of travel lanes, width of bicycle lanes, so on, factors about the routes themselves, and then gave it a rating. Uh, it doesn't take into account land use or destinations. It's really about the route to get there, not about what you can get to. Um, the Bikeway Quality Index did, however, feed into the Portland Cycle Zone Analysis, which broke up the city into 32 zones and said, Overall, how, uh, how good is this zone for biking um, currently, and how good could it be going forward? Uh, 
so for the for the cycle zone analysis, it, it like I said, it took into account bikeway quality. It also looked at physical barriers, street connectivity, land topography or slope, um, and land use. The thing that I'll say about land use for this is that um, they looked at basically where is the nearest possible commercial uh, commercially commercially zoned lot to any given place, um, which is you know it's a good place to start thinking about land use. But it doesn't really get to the complexity of what daily needs are, what the variety of destinations are, um, and you know. So if you had one place particularly close to your location, um, that doesn't mean that you can get your daily needs met uh, more broadly. So the next question is, where are the places that we visit? How do you identify and map those destinations? How do you kind of get to that point where you have good enough data about where you where people go and where you know what their needs are? So I went to the National Household Transportation Survey and looked at uh, daily or at um, non-work home-based trips. The reason why I chose non-work home-based trips is because I wanted to know, again, this idea of meeting your daily needs. So it wasn't about you know, getting to work. It was about taking care of uh, the kids, the cleaners, the getting food, all, all those essentials. Um, so what I found was that shopping and errands accounted for about 25% of those trips. Of those, about 17% were kind of daily purchases, grocery store, clothing, hardware. 8% were basic services, uh, going to the post office, going to the bank, and so on. Um, recreational and social things took up about 33% or 34% of uh, trips. About 9% were working, uh, related to working out, going to parks, that sort of a thing. 8% were food, uh, restaurant related. 9% were hanging out with friends. 4% were going to the pub or going to the theater, kind of that sort of entertainment. And then other trips accounted for 40%. Uh, of, those, of that, about 10% were school related and 5.5% were uh, religious, going to like churches and that sort of a thing. Uh, you'll notice there's a big gap between the 40% and the sum of those bottom ones. There were a lot of kind of smaller trips that were factored in there. Amongst those are like daycare, taking care of your pet, uh, transporting other people, which was you know, interesting in trying to think about how does that transfer over to cycling. Um, but this is kind of the, the realm of the kinds of trips that people make. So I needed to find those places and be able to map them in order to kind of build this assessment. So how do you locate those places? Um, the first place I looked was at Metro's regional land information system which for those of you that work with GIS know that it's an amazing resource here in Portland. Um, from that resource, I was able to pull uh, transit, like light rail and bus lines, uh, schools, libraries, parks. Ma uh, those are the, the main things that I pulled from our list, and those are mapped on there. Um, you can see that they're pretty well spread out, although there's obviously the noticeable thing is there's a lot of uh, transit centered around the downtown area. That's not surprising. Um, the next resource that I looked to was Reference USA, which is a, a source that we have access to through subscription here at Portland State. And it's basically a list of all businesses in the Portland area, businesses and services and, and those kinds of places. Um, from Reference USA, I was able to pull address data for all uh, child care providers, grocery stores, clothing stores, uh, general goods stores, beauty services, banks mail uh, services like post offices, uh, laundries and cleaners, gyms, uh, entertainment establishments, uh, movie theaters, restaurants, coffee shops, and, uh, and so on. Overall, uh, there were 6,000 uh, businesses in this area uh, that I was looking at, which basically corresponded to Portland and East Multnomah, uh, yeah, in East Multnomah County. Um, so that's, once I had all of these things in my database, I knew where, where do people go. Now I had to figure out how, how do they get there. So we get to this issue of how far will a cyclist travel and how big an area can they cover from any given starting location. Um, I first looked at the willingness to cycle. Like this is this issue of how far will people go. I looked at, I guess just if, if you think about the 20 minute neighborhood, then okay, let's think about what's 20 minutes by bike. If you assume 10 miles per hour, then you get to 3.3 miles. Um, the, that's the top line up there. The, the ones that are down from there are based on the, uh, the Portland GPS, uh, the PSU GPS study that was done a couple years ago. Um, and these are the median trip length, lengths based on a variety of different kinds of trips. 
As you can see, the overall trip length is a little bit lower than that 20 minutes by bike. And if you take out the work trips, it actually drops down to this uh, area of 1 to 2.1 miles um, for, the, for the median trip. So some were longer, some were shorter. Um, the one thing that I, that I would note is that if you're looking about going forward and about trying to encourage more people to bike, the, the actual distances that people are going to be willing to, to cycle in the future are probably going to be towards this lower end. They're probably not going to be towards the three to four miles um, because we're looking at people that, that are new cyclists and they're probably less enthusiastic about it. Um, so that was in, so these kind of helped inform the distances that I would look for for how far people would go. The second thing that I looked at was uh, the data that was uh, presented here actually by Joe Broach. I don't know if Joe here? No. Uh, he presented this in a transportation seminar last, uh, I think it was in, in the spring, um, which is this idea that uh, for any given facility type, it's going to influence how willing, you know, how, how much you're going to be willing to travel on that facility. Um, the baseline is a bike lane. So if you're willing to go one mile, that's, you, you'll go one mile on a bike lane. That's the baseline. A bike boulevard, for that same willingness of one mile, you'd, be, you'd actually go 1.22 miles. You'd go further um, with the same kind of threshold for how far you, you're, you want to go. A bike path, you'd go even further, 1.35 miles. And then we get down into these areas that are less conducive to biking, so arterials and highways. And for those, you know, maybe your total willingness is two miles, but on a highway that would translate to to 0.28 miles, that'd be twice the, the one mile threshold. So basically, you know, the nicer the conditions, the, f the further you can get. Um, to translate this into uh, uh, this analysis, um, basically I use Network Analyst. Uh, for any given route that's in Network Analyst, it's, I assigned uh, the number of feet, the actual number of feet. So if we said that, you know, for example, uh, the actual route is a thousand feet. Then I took that number and divided it by those distances that I just outlined in the previous slide. So the one mile for the bike lane, 1.22 for the bike boulevard, and got an effective length in the in the right-hand column there. So what that effective length is telling you is that if you're willing to travel a thousand feet, well, if you're on a bike boulevard, you would get you would have done that a thousand feet, but it would o have only taken up 819 feet of your willingness. So you would still be willing to go further. You'd be willing to go another uh, 191 feet if it was on a bike lane, even further if it's on a bike boulevard. So again, it's kind of expanding the area that you'd be willing to travel. Um, to give you an example of what this looks like in practice, here are a couple of East Portland uh, examples. So from our starting point at the, the triangle there, that yellow triangle, uh, here's a network that's built out on the, on the existing bike infrastructure network of uh, 0.25 miles, 0.5, 1, 2, and 2.5, and that goes out from the varying colors. What you can see is that um, the green line there is a low traffic bikeway, essentially similar to a bike boulevard, although I, it's not technically classified as that out there. And what that does it is, is it extends the area that you can cover in that north-south direction. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I just it was, want to make one. Sure. Is that not working? All right. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Um, so basically, what this shows you is that the 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 shape of your network, of the area that you can, that you're willing to get to, that you that you're able to cover, it expands in the area of the infrastructure. So the better the infrastructure, the the further you can go. Um, a second example is taken down by the, um, uh, by the Springwater Corridor Trail. Um, and this basically shows you can get pretty far out the, the Springwater Corridor east-west. Um, and there's some barriers down in the south there that are preventing uh, the network from expanding down there. But it's kind of, you know, it's elongated along the areas where there's better, um, better infrastructure. Uh, so we now know where the destinations are. We now know kind of an idea of how we're going to figure out you know, what, are the, what, are, what is the bike shed, what is the area that you can cover. Um, so I'm now going to move on to how do you take those and put them together and evaluate bikeability. How do you take that and make an objective score for uh, whether you know, an area is suitable for meeting your daily needs by bike. Um, to do that, I first started by saying, OK, I'm going to select some, some home locations, some origin points. I'm going to take some from East Portland, some from downtown, uh, inner east and north Portland. These were taken uh, somewhat randomly, but I also wanted to get a, a variety of different neighborhoods. 
Um, so you know, th those are the ones that I selected. Um, and next, I, I wanted to figure out a way to arrive at a score. Um, and this is an area where it's a little bit similar to the idea of walk score, where you get, a di you get different points if you meet different needs. Um, so th these numbers are taken from the, uh, the National Household Transportation Survey numbers that I pointed at before. And um, the basic idea here is that, okay, if you meet your school needs, uh, then that's 10, 10 points out of 100 possible points. If you meet your, you know, the movie theaters, that's 2.5. Restaurants, it's 7.5. A couple things to note here are that this is, uh, this is a method, it's a process. It's something that will adapt with time. And so as there becomes more, as it gets to be more research available, it says, well, maybe, uh, maybe child care is more important than 2.5 points. You know, it can be adjusted and changed. And so this is kind of a starting point to say, OK, if we were to use this system, what would it look like and how would we work with it? Um, so how do you get the full points within any one of those given categories? Basically, we're going to take a wedge there. Fly it off. Um, so here's our 2.5 possible points. And I think that was banks, but it could be any of those factors. Um, so for the proximity, what I did was I said, OK, we have our start, starting point in the center of that diamond there. And as you expand out, as you go one mile, that's the kind of the, the red diamond there. Um, anything that's within that, you'll get 100% of the credit for those destinations. It, and then it kind of, you get less and less credit as it goes further away. So the things that are within a mile, that's really easy. You're going to be anxious to jump on your bike and go there. Um, no problems. Things that are between one and two miles, you might think twice. Things that are between two and two and a half, it's a little bit further. Uh, beyond that, it's it makes it a little bit, uh, you know, some people might cho choose not to go. Uh, and so, you know, basically you would get zero, zero points beyond that area. Um, I also wanted to factor in variety into the score. And so when I had mentioned before that, you know, it, you might not be able to meet your restaurant needs by having one restaurant really close by. Um, you might need, for example, here I, what I wanted to do was say, OK, for restaurants, you might need up to 12 restaurants in order to get the variety that you would seek so that you know, maybe you wouldn't want the same thing every day. Maybe, you would, maybe you're a vegetarian, and you assume that you know, if there are 12 restaurants, then you're going to have the variety to find one that suits your needs or to find one that uh, you would want you know, one day and then a different one the next. Um, for things like schools, there it's 10 total points, but there should be you know, a preschool, an elementary school, a middle school, and a high school. Um, it's a lot of data, but basically the idea behind this table is to say, OK, variety is factored in, and you know, certain, certain kinds of destinations have different uh, you know, factor into the accessibility of the neighborhood differently. Um, and then here's a map of how the, the, these bike sheds fit on top of the destinations to say, OK, these are the places you can get to. I know that the colors are, don't really show up very well on here. But basically, what you can see is that you know, obviously, with the, the, the larger bike shed, the 2.5 miles, you can get to a lot of places. And then it gets you know, fewer and fewer as you go in. These destinations were taken and counted. Um, and so for that particular example, I've done a count of all of the destinations within a quarter mile, all of the destinations within a half mile, all of the destinations within one mile, uh, and so on, out to 2.5. Um, and, and so those were the, the, the numbers of destinations that were then factored into the score. Um, and I'll give that. Again, my apologies for the several large tables in a row. I think this is the last of the big tables that we'll have to look at. Um, so here, basically, what this shows are the destinations on the left-hand side, and then the number of points received in that category on, down the right-hand side. Uh, the categories where less than the full score was received uh, are in bold there. And so you'll see that, for example, uh, libraries. There were no libraries. That's the, the fourth uh, destination down. There were no libraries within the one mile uh, area. That would have been full points within one mile. But there were two within uh, two miles. And so for that category, you get 50% of the possible score. You get 1.25 points. You sum those all up, and you get the actual bikeability score down at the bottom. Um, so 
it was a bit of a process. Uh, and I think that that's kind of the idea is that this is putting together this process and, and kind of thinking about what are the questions that you need to ask and where does it get you. Now we're actually getting somewhere. We're going to have some scores here. So these are the scores that I came up with. Um, the first number there is just the location number. The second number is the score. You'll see that in the downtown areas, the scores are quite high. They had an average of uh, 96 within the downtown and inner Portland areas. The areas uh, in East Portland average 76. Uh, so that's considerably lower. The, the other thing that you'll note is that because you know, this, this method hasn't been applied to other places at this point, uh, these are relative scores. What you can take is that you know, a 76 is relatively lower than a 96. It's not, it's not necessarily a C versus an A. Um, but relatively, those inner Portland areas are doing better. You may notice that around the periphery of the East Portland locations, so the, the area up here, then down and along the side, the scores are lower. And then you get a few that are higher right in the middle. Uh, one of the interesting things that I found was that there are pretty good uh, multi-use paths in those periphery, uh, periphery, periphery areas. Uh, but at the same time, there are highways. And so you might have good infrastructure in some of those places, but there aren't necessarily, but there are also big barriers. There are also um, not a lot of destinations near highways that you'd want to go to. So it kind of paints this picture of, uh, you know, infrastructure isn't the only thing. It's certainly an important part of, uh, you know, about how, about, how about, about how bikeable an area is, but uh, you've got to look to other factors. So what can we learn from all this? Um, well, what is the impact of infrastructure on an area? One of the things that I thought was really interesting was that uh, when I looked at how many bike lanes there were within uh, the proximity of a given location, there were approximately the same number of uh, miles of bike lanes uh, near the locations in East Portland and downtown. There was three to four miles of bike lanes within, any, within one mile of any given place. Either the, in either the downtown or uh, East Portland locations. The same was true for multi-use paths. On average, there was 1 to 1.25 1 to 1 1 uh, miles of multi-use paths within, within a mile of a starting point. Um, the big difference came in the area of bike boulevards and similar uh, facilities. In the East Portland areas, there was an average of 1 to 2 miles of bike uh, sorry, 1.2 miles of bike boulevards within a mile of a starting location. If you look at the locations downtown, the average was 7.1 miles of bike boulevards within a mile of any starting point. Um, so that really gives you a sense of, okay, maybe this is a factor that is contributing to really low biking rates in East Portland. It certainly, um, it certainly was a, a stark difference. Um, this is a this is just a map of what uh, of the bike sheds from all of those given starting points. I know they start to kind of run over each other, and it's a little bit hard to tell exactly what's going on. But if we if we break it down and look at the uh, the smaller uh, breaks, so the the blue now is the one mile. That would be the the first break for the uh, for the bikeable areas. You can see that the East Portland locations are quite a bit bigger, I mean, are quite a bit smaller than the downtown Portland locations. One thing that I took from this um, is that the, the the better infrastructure and better connectivity, in, you know, obviously makes it a more appealing more appealing to a bike downtown. But it also means you can get to more places. In fact, uh, you can cover two points, to about two miles of uh, two square miles of uh, surface area by biking one mile in downtown Portland. If in, in, in East Portland, those numbers are about 1.5 miles of uh, surface area by biking uh, one mile. So you can get about 33% further, or cover 33% more uh, area in downtown Portland. Um, all right. Uh, and I guess you know the other thing I thought that was interesting about the, the the study and infrastructure in uh, in East Portland versus downtown Portland was uh, again. If you look at the service area, this is um, along the x-axis. This is the the service area, the square mileage of the area that you can get to. Uh, if you look at East Portland, the bikeability scores go up considerably as the service area gets bigger. 
Uh, for downtown Portland, it's pretty stable. Once you hit that 1.5 miles of service area, uh, the scores are all pretty consistently high. So it, it looks as if uh, being able to get further is more important in areas like East Portland where there are fewer uh, services. Um, that gets us to the area of what is the impact of land use. Um, actually, one more slide there, sorry. Uh, I also wanted to look at the impact of infrastructure and, and think about what does it look like going forward if we change uh, what, the inf what the infrastructure on the ground is. So I took the 2030 bike plan and m built it into this model and said, okay, if, we, if the 2030 bike plan was built out uh, as it's in the plan, what, what would that look like and how would that affect scores? Uh, one thing that I thought was interesting was that uh, while there is obviously a big focus on bike boulevards and similar facilities all throughout Portland, um, it really builds out the network much better than it is now in East Portland. Uh, it, building this into the, into the model, you, uh, it turns out that that leads to about a 17% increase in the size of the area that you can get to. So you can get to, you know, from 1.5 miles, it gets 17% larger, the, the square mileage that you can cover. Um, in terms of what that does to the bikeability scores, in East Portland, is the bikeability scores by about two points on average. Uh, in downtown Portland, it actually it raised the scores by one point. Um, again, uh, that's not to say that it's 1% or 2% uh, more accessible, but, but in terms of this rating, uh, it's certainly better. Um, so now we'll move on to understanding the impacts of land use. Um, one thing that I wanted to find out here is if you have more destinations, does, what does that do to the bikeability score? So if it's a, if it's a higher density, what does that mean? Uh, if you look at the destinations per square mile, that's on the x-axis here, and the bikeability score on the y-axis, um, there, there is a relationship between, destina between this destination density and the bikeability score throughout all destinations. It's a stronger relationship in East Portland, though. Um, and that makes sense, I think. The more destinations you have, uh, if you have, if you have a fewer, if you're fewer to begin with, it's going to make a bigger difference for each added one. Um, but I wanted to look at more uh, about the specific kinds of destinations and where the, where the, the gaps in the coverage were there. Um, this is a, a table, and I apologize, there was one more table. <laughs> Uh, the by category, the uh, the points lost by category. The, this is sorted by the most points lost in East Portland on the top, and then going down. You'll see, or you may not see. I don't know, but uh, full grocery stores lost on average 4.33 bikeability points in East Portland. That's compared to only 0.58 uh, in Inner Portland. Uh, other areas where there was a pretty significant loss of points included movie theaters, light rail stops fitness locations, libraries, restaurants. Um, so what do you do with this data? One thing that I thought would be, OK, if I could map where, uh, where the existing grocery stores are and where, you know, if you build out a mile from, that, uh, from each of those stores, kind of those are the areas that would be uh, accessible to a grocery store. Um, so here's a map of what that looks like. This is, again, the dots are each of the current uh, existing grocery stores. And that coverage area is that one mile uh, area going out from there using the infrastructure that's there today. Um, you'll see pretty big gaps in East Portland, and whereas inner and downtown Portland is pretty well covered. Um, one of the things that I thought was, okay, if we were to plot a couple of uh, suggested grocery stores, those are those stars there, how could we fill in some of those gaps in coverage, and what would that do to the bikeability scores if we did that? Um, what I found, I reran the, the program again, and what I found was that the bikeability scores in East Portland went up by about one to two percentage points, or one to two points per, uh, on average per location. So that's a, I mean, three stores is not an easy thing to do, and certainly you know, you'd have to think about incentives or how do you, you, know, how do you plan for that. But, um, but that's one small area, and it certainly, uh, combined with some other approaches, could have an impact in making you know, more land uses, more types of destinations accessible. Um, so uh, a few next steps to think about. Um, how do you incorporate a, a variety of root characteristics into this kind of a model? Um, the next step, I think, would be, OK, not just looking at you know, is it a bike lane or a bike boulevard or, uh, or a highway. 
what is the slope? What is the lane width? What, are the surf what is the surface like? So kind of building in some of these other factors uh, to make the model more complex and a little bit more realistic about what the bike conditions are on the road. Um, one of the things I think that that could do is uh, point to, you know, if you have an area like that inner, uh, in the East Portland, some of those uh, high scores were around the gateway area. Um, and those may be places where there are a lot of destinations. But we, you know, from biking out there, you might know, okay, the, the bike lanes are pretty narrow. Or the traffic is way too intense and I don't want to bike out there. So building in some of those factors that aren't just, that aren't factored into just the fact that there's a bike lane. Um, the next thing would be to refine the weighting system and the scoring system. Uh, as I mentioned, as new research comes up, it'll show, it, it may show that certain kinds of destinations are more important um, and or, or underrepresented or you know, however, so you could tweak the system and make it more refined that way. And then finally to operationalize the assessment. So how do you take um, this process and build it into a system where, you know, so it could be something like walk score where you could just type in an address and say, okay, this is your bikeability score. This is, uh, these are the destinations that you can get to. These are the areas where, uh, where you're lacking or where, you know, where there's a problem, where there's a gap. Um, so I think those are some of the important next steps. And I guess I would just close out by saying, um, you know, I think that this kind of a tool can be pretty useful for governments in terms of uh, examining the strengths and weaknesses of existing infrastructure and looking for areas where, uh, where it needs to be improved. Um, for looking at land uses that, and destination types that may need attention, that may need uh, programs to incentivize them and uh, you know, just kind of more thought given to them. Um, and finally, just looking at the, uh, the impact of planned or uh, potential future investments, what will those do to, how bike, to, to, be, to affect uh, how bikeable a neighborhood is? Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with that. But I would just say, uh, you know, I found this a really interesting process in terms of uh, really trying to dig into the connection between uh, transportation, infrastructure, and, and land uses, and uh, building a connection and saying, OK, how do we create an assessment that takes these into, ac an, uh, into account and ends up with you know, pushing, pushing the knowledge a little bit further and building the next steps for you know whatever comes next. So um, I'm open for questions. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to know your thoughts about um, how we can you know improve bicycling in the neighborhoods. You think if we create a network or bike path throughout the neighborhoods mm -hmm. so that people can feel safe. Uh, my impression is they don't want to get onto, onto a road where a lot of cars are going and they think they're jeopardizing their yeah. life. So if you have a separate bike path mm -hmm. in the neighborhoods connecting the grocery stores and other needs, do you think that is a helpful thing? Um, I mean, I, I do think it'd be a helpful thing. I, th I think that you know, one of the difficulties is that, you know, as I had mentioned, the areas where there are existing bike paths, um, kind of off-street bike paths, uh, tended to be in areas where, where there were fewer destinations or where there were bigger barriers. So if you could have those kinds of facilities going through neighborhoods where there weren't barriers and where there were land, you know, lots of land uses, I think it would definitely be helpful. Um, the trick is to uh, how, do you, how do you make that happen, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah. Were uh, food carts evaluated in the uh, you know, restaurant or cafe style? And do, like, would they have a significant effect on you know, the, the, the bike road score? Yeah, that's a good question. And um, I actually, I would have to go back in and look at the data. I didn't, I didn't insert the food carts in, so if they were within you know, to the degree that they were categorized as restaurants um, by by Reference USA, which is the source from which it was drawn, um, they would be in there. And I, but I, I haven't actually looked to see. I, and I think that that would be an interesting uh, thing to try to add in. I know that, you know, obviously most of the food carts tend to be downtown, but that's not 
entirely the case. Um, so the degree to which those are spread out in some of these neighborhoods that are lacking restaurants, that would certainly be uh, helpful in terms of improving bikeability. Bike ability, the mode share change. Yeah. And one of the things that makes um, someone more bikeable is the fact that you already bicycle every day. Mm -hmm. So if you cycle every day for school, it's easier to get on your bike and go somewhere else because yeah. you're used to it. So when I was looking at splitting amongst, you know, 30 or 40 different types, it's difficult to see how you could, um, how that would encourage people to add infrastructure that would encourage people to get in that bike for the first time. Yeah. Once they've done that, it's easy to get to other places. Um, and I think, I mean, it sounds like you're referring to, you know, basically trip chaining so that if you're already going out, it's easier to stop and hit another type of place or, you know, take care of more than one thing at once or... M more um, getting people who wouldn't tend to bike. You know, let's say my area is fairly bikeable and now you add a library. I'm not going to suddenly get on my bike if I don't cycle regularly. Yeah. Or if but I you might regularly right? to one place. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm comfortable getting on a bike. Yeah, and I think. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think obviously exposure would be really important, um, and I think that you know, that's a process that kind of has to be part of the equation as well. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how you would factor that into um, an assessment, it, but but it, it may well. I mean, yeah. Alex? How much does the, did you look at the bikeability scores correlated at all with the mode change? Um, I didn't specifically look at the correlation, although, uh, so just off the top of my head, yeah, those, the areas where the, where the bike mode share was the highest were also the highest bikeability scores. Um, but that said, the mode share dropped off faster than the bikeability scores did. So, um, and, and I, you know, and again, if you look at areas like Gateway, where there were pretty high bikeability scores, um, the mode share wasn't any higher there than uh, in the surrounding areas. Um, so I think that there is a connection, but I, but I also think that you know, there's something else going on. studies and information gathering, did you take into consideration the economic conditions within neighborhoods that would be people that cyclists would be cycling through, such as crime rate, um, yeah. the number of uh, vacant buildings, uh, things of that nature? Uh, that's a really good question. And I, I didn't. And, uh, at least I didn't try to. <laughs> um, I would say that you know, in areas where there's a lot of vacancies, that would show up in the fact that there were fewer services and shops and that sort of a thing. And, uh, crime rates, I don't know, you know, I, I didn't factor them in. I haven't seen any research on how that affects willingness to cycle. Um, I'm sure it probably does, but it I, would be an interesting thing to look into. In places like Chicago, definitely, definitely, um, you, you choose your route carefully. Yeah. All right. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I did, I actually did run uh, this assessment on, uh, on those walkable distances as well, so kind of the quarter mile, half mile, and one mile. And uh, yeah, I, I did find that, that the scores dropped off faster in East Portland than in downtown. So, um, you know, some of the, particularly in the downtown, downtown locations, um, you know, you could, you could meet all of your needs by walking, or most of them. Um, and so I think that, and again, I think that plays into this idea that the, the larger the bike shed, that, that has more importance in areas that have uh, 
a lower density of uh, destinations of land use of, of kind of commercial land uses. Um, so yeah, I and I guess the other thing I did kind of uh, I didn't factor this into my paper and my work at all um, was that I looked at. For some of these locations, I went to the, the walkscore.com page and typed it in and saw what their scores were. Um, they generally tended to be higher than what I was coming up with. Uh, and I think that part of the reason for that is that, again, if there was any destination at all, they gave it the full points. Um, and they were following this as the crow flies, not the, the street network. Um, so I think that they may be overrepresenting somewhat how walkable a neighborhood is. Um, Yeah, I also think it's really great. Um, and from the umbrella of active communities, mm -hmm. somehow combining it with, I mean, because the people who are doing walkability uh, from an academic point of view are interested in the same kind of things. And I mean, as a land use planner, what I'd love to see is more walkable, whether people are biking or walking yeah. more. Um, so we're everybody's getting at that angle, but combining it somehow, and then um, yeah, refining some of your uh, uh, your scoring. Uh, one of the things you mentioned was uh, schools and yeah. looking at demographics. I mean, I'm sure you can get more refined in all the categories, but most people don't have four kids, so they're not going to have a need for awful. all different. Mm -hmm. But if you did like one or two, if they have one or two, a different kind of score because people are having just one or two kids now. Yeah. And actually, that points uh, something that I didn't mention here was that the idea of uh, of specializing scores based on the the person that's seeking the score. So maybe you would put in some data um, about you know what you are like and what your needs are, or what your demographic background is, whatever. Um, that may play into a different score. Um, or the kind of routes that you like, for example, you know, what is your what is your cycling behavior, or whatever. Um, there's actually a, a a group that's doing that. They're just I think they've just done it in Minnesota now. I think it's oh, what's it called? It's it's mentioned. Uh, I mentioned it in my paper. I forget the name of the. They have a website um, where you basically I think you answer a few questions before you look at the assessment, and it'll tell you it'll kind of specialize a route based on. Um, what you what you would like, um, yeah. So we have a couple web questions, and I'll just paraphrase one of them. Um, sort of off the topic, I guess, of your scoring system. Did you think about what other things might incentivize someone to either bike or walk, such as a system that maybe includes how much CO two emissions they're saving? You know, when you go to the site or something like that. How would you incentivize someone to bike or walk? Um, with the information that sort of that you would be providing with yeah. a walk score, bike score type. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I haven't thought about that in terms of this project. Uh, one of the th one of the uses that I do think something like this could have. Uh, Kind of relates to neighborhood choice and, and real estate and where do you you know people might look at something like this and if they saw oh well I live in a very bikeable neighborhood be more more inclined to do it or they might say I want a more bikeable neighborhood where how can I go find that and then go go look and, and, and locate that um, I don't know how this would directly incentivize people or or how the the factors involved there would do that, but maybe. Todd? Are there any plans for, I guess, web application putting this on the internet and um, people to? I, I, I'm interested in doing that. I haven't, uh, I haven't figured out how I would do that yet. Um, although, it, and I do know that there are other efforts being made to kind of build in uh, assessments of, of bikeability. Um, I know that uh, I know that WalkScore is looking at how do you how they would do that. Um, I don't know what their plans are in terms of when that happens or and, and it, kind of what the factors they include are. Um, but I do think that you know 
you need to have a really good database of, uh, of destinations, locations. Um, and once you have that, and, and kind of the, the mapping ability to kind of map a bike shed from any given point, it would be pretty easy. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the absence of the commute to work in the score, because I yeah. think that's a really huge factor in yeah. any truly bikeable neighborhood. And yeah. explain why you left that out, or what yeah. might be done to include it. Um, I I certainly do think it's an important thing. Um, the reason I left it out was because it was really this was focusing on on the neighborhood that it was in, and so kind of trying to look at. Uh, what was there? How? How? What kind of daily needs can be met? Um, and I think that the the point that you know, if people are already out on their bikes, they're more likely to to do more things on their bikes. I think that's entirely true. Um, and so, and that is also always going to be a difficulty for a place that's say five, six miles away from downtown or further. Um, I think that that may be something that happens next, or or you know that needs to be factored into the next version. Um, the reason I left it out is because that's not specifically located to the neighborhood that you're looking at, um, but I do think it's an important factor and something to to look at. Yeah. I was wondering, um, are you thinking about possibly looking at comparing the numbers that for your scores for areas to the current? Um, Modal split for non-commute work for bicyclists as a way of possibly like rebalancing scores or validating them more. Um, so comparing it to the you said the non-commute mode split. Yes, or non-commute mode split. You know, I honestly don't know. <laughs> the data on that is a lot is not nearly as good, and I and I don't really know where it is. Um, the reason why these things tend to focus on. The reason why mode splits tend to be look at the you know the commute to work trip is because that's the questions that are asked generally. So I mean that's I think what the census asks, that's what um, the city auditor asks. Um, but I, I you know I think that that's something that to get good data uh, to look at that would be a really useful thing. So. Yeah. Did you look at? Um the number of bicycles that were actually using destinations as a way to inform the models at all. I know the city is kind of large; that would be difficult to do on a you know yeah. citywide scale. But like sampling, because I noticed um, that you have like Costco and Safeway and stuff as grocery stores, mm -hmm. and I would imagine the number of bicycles going to Costco is a lot less than the number of bicycles going to like Safeway and stuff. Probably, although you know, I, I don't know. I, I I don't live close enough to a Costco to know, but um. Uh, I chose n s so from the in the National Household Transportation Survey, you can narrow it down to only those trips that are taken by bicycle. I chose not to do that for a couple reasons. Um, one is that I, I forget exactly what the numbers are, but it's somewhere between a third and a half of of those trips are taken just for exercise. So they're really, I mean, it's not people that are using their bikes for utilitarian means. Um, and I really wanted to get at. You know, how do you think about um, promoting bikes or, or the usefulness of bikes as utilitarian transport? Um, and uh, and so I, I wanted to look at you know what all what are what are all of the trips that are taking place, regardless of how people are doing them right now, and think about maybe at some point in the future they'd be more willing to do that. Um, and I guess I, the other thing I would tell you is that a couple of years ago I never thought I would do grocery shopping on a bike, and I do now regularly. And so you kind of figure it out. And so uh, you know maybe Costco would be too much, but uh, um, you know I know another one that's huge is uh, uh, what's what's there's a big discount grocery store on 102nd. Winco. Winco, that's it. Where like you know you can get massive quantities of things, but you don't have to. You can get unmassive quantities. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, but I, I think that that would be a good question: is you know, should should a place like that be included? And um, and going forward, I don't know whether it, whether bicyclists will ever use Costco. I hope so. Yeah. 
You talked a little bit about multimodal routes, but I'm wondering, and I know light rail was on your big table, but how do bus lines play a factor? Because I know I choose to live close to bus lines and mm -hmm. will bike, you know, kind of fair weather biker, but how yeah. does that play? Um, well, they were, so bus lines were one of the factors, and what I looked at was um, essentially how many lines were nearby a given location. Um, thinking this over, again, it, it may be more useful to look at you know, the frequency of the line, but I, but I kind of, as a proxy, said, okay, you know, the average person you know, might need more than one line because they have different places they need to go, or the more lines, the more frequency. Um, I think, I, f I forget exactly what the number was for what the, uh, I could figure this out, bus, 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 bus. I, I forget what the numbers were. The, the bus, uh, bus, bus lines were factored in. It was something like between two and a half and five percent of the score. Um, and a again, that's kind of thinking about, you know, how likely or do cyclists need to either either connect to transportation or is it something that makes the, you know, getting by on just a bike an easier thing for those times when you're not going to take your bike. Um, but actually, I think that second, that second question is an interesting factor that could be studied more. So, anybody else? Yeah? yeah. Just one question I have. The, the reason, as a, as a deterrent of the Americans is the luxury and affordability of owning a car Mm -hmm. Do you think is that the uh, problem, which is, uh, you know, coming as a veteran for the, oh, I don't want to fight, I can afford a car, why have to take a fight? Like yeah. Because I compare, uh, you know, like, I'm from a country, third world country, India, where there's no affordable person, you know, who can afford a car. So yeah. we, we don't think there's a bike out there or not, or I'm going 196 feet more or less. Or we Let's go. The question was, is affordability um, that the wealth in yeah. America is a deterrent uh, to the use of bike? Yeah. And instead of, you know, we are telling, everybody is telling people that, you know, bike, this is a mm -hmm. bike route, we yeah. are creating this and that, the other, but it's still the numbers are not going up. Yeah. What is your opinion? Um, my, I mean, I, I guess what I'd say is that uh, clearly, cost is a factor. Um, when, when the oil prices were at their highest, uh, you know, biking, biking went up dramatically during that time. And uh, now that oil prices have dropped, it seems like those increases are, are leveling off or maybe even going down. I don't know. Um, so I think that f cost is a factor. I don't think it's the only factor. And, and I guess the other thing that um, there there is evidence out there that if you get people exposed to biking, so if you just get them out on on one trip, they're more likely to continue doing it. So, um, you know, maybe there need to be more incentives to get people out biking, and maybe you know, one of those would be if if it was more expensive to drive, or if or if gas gas prices go up again, more people might go out. But I think that there's a, a stickiness to like that exposure of biking, um, and particularly if you have better infrastructure, more more accessibility. So if it's easier and, and you know, a better choice, then I think more people are going to uh, do it and stick with it. So, so uh, before we thank Nathan for his great presentation, I want to make the advertisement for next week. So Peter Jacobson uh, is going to be talking about Vision Zero to Towards Zero Death. He's the OTREC uh, visiting scholar, and you might know Peter Jacobson of, as a uh, safety and numbers fame. So with that, let's thank Nathan. Thank you.